Government bureaucrats destroyed under cross-examination. Martin North, John Adams, in the interest of the people. Hello, John. Hello, sir. So what are we talking about today, then? So today, Martin, we're going to talk about the cash ban. Uh, we're going to talk about the public hearing that occurred on the 12th of December about a week and a half ago. So this is the first of two hearings. So there was a big kerfuffle um, uh, because the first hearing was only announced the night before um, the hearing actually took place. Um, so what we know now is, is that there's a second hearing coming up on the 30th of January. Um, and then the report is due on the 7th of February. And then the week of the 10th of February, in all likelihood, the bill will come to a vote. So, uh, I mean, we, we've spoken a lot about this off camera. Um, we think it's, this is a very big threshold issue. It's not just uh, an issue of symbolism. Unconventional monetary policy will be implemented uh, in some form or another um, in 2020. We're at three quarter of a percent on interest rates. We're going to half a percent in February. We could go to a quarter by June, and then the second half, and just like Westpac says, well, we're off to the races with starting off with QE, um, and, and I have no doubt that the negative interest rates will come in in one form or another within the next uh, um, 18 to 24 months. So, um, you know, so, so, so this is a big uh, issue that I think is fundamental, and we only have seven weeks to uh, stop the government from passing this. Um, you know, one of the things that, that we, we talked about off camera just before we started today was, um, you know, this whole issue of the Prime Minister going off to Hawaii when, when the country's in, um, in flames. Um, you know, it just speaks to uh, this Prime Minister, who I actually participated in putting him and his party into power. He doesn't care about the country. He doesn't care about us. Um, I mean, in, in an earlier show, we interviewed um, Steve Holland from Victoria about what happened in Ballarat with the um, uh, with the Victorian um, uh, Liberal count, State Council meeting. Uh, you know, we've heard since then that even though ninety five percent of the membership says we don't want this, uh, this is um, the, the, you know an anathema to the Liberal Party. The senators from Victoria have said we we won't cross the floor. We will vote for this, and we're basically going to um, you know you the membership. We're just not going to listen to you. So so this government is out of touch. It doesn't care. Um, this is a, th a threshold issue of, of freedom of liberty. Um, and, and we have only seven weeks to uh, stop this. And, and obviously the, the key issue will be is we know the government's going to vote for it. It all comes down to the ALP. So I think, um, you know, uh, it looks like obviously One Nation, the Greens, uh, Centre Alliance looks like they will vote against it. So, so, so you, know, um, you know, everyone who cherishes freedom in this country, we really have to push hard in the next seven weeks. Otherwise, this is going to become the law of the land. Yep. It's a really critical issue. And, uh, you know, some people say you're talking about it too much, right? But I think it's so critical and it has become quite symbolic, if you like, of just how far Canberra is away from the reality of what it's like to be an ordinary Australian. Precisely, precisely. And, and one of the things that we're going to cover in today's show is, so in this uh, hearing that took place on the 12th of December, um, there was uh, four government agencies that testified to the, to the senators, uh, and then there were six non-government agencies. Um, now, obviously, obviously, all of the government agencies said they are in support of the bill, representing the government. And then in terms of the non-government witnesses, uh, five of the six were against and only one, the Uniting Church of Australia, uh, was for it. And everyone's still scratching their head to say, well, why is the church taking a position on economics um, um, when, when, when they, I think the churches have more pressing issues to uh, focus on? Yeah, and it's worth saying, I think, that those public officials did a very poor job because as soon as they started speaking, it was clear that there was really very little substance behind the intent of the bill. Indeed, indeed. So, so you know, you know, um, one, one thing I'll, I'll say um, um, today on camera is, so with this second round of hearings, um, um, uh, I haven't been invited yet technically 
but I have been approached uh, and the, um, I'm, I am in discussions with uh, officials in the Senate about testifying on the 30th of January in Sydney. So, um, you know, so I, I've got to, you know, um, so I think this could be big. All the work we've been doing, all the commentary, the bulk of the submissions have come from our audience. Um, you know, if I have the opportunity to uh, testify, um, you know, that would be big. And, and part of the c case I'll be making if I get to testify is to say that the government's case basically has fallen apart under tough cross-examination, which occurred a week and a half ago. And what I want to do is to highlight seven key points that I took from about four or five hours of testimony, because for those uh, members of the audience who are still uh, lobbying politicians over the next seven weeks to say vote against this, I think some of these seven key points I'm going to highlight today are, are very critical to proving that, that the government's case doesn't stack up um, and that there are unintended consequences to this legislation that the government hasn't considered. The hearings which ran for about five or six hours in total, it was all, it was all recorded, it's all there available to watch on the uh, parliamentary website and of course it's all in Hansard as well, isn't it? Correct. Correct. So, so, so where I want to start today's conversation is, um, so, th so the government's case for this legislation is about tax. It's about tax evasion, the integrity of the tax system. So um, now um, we're going to play a couple of clips uh, that talk about the tax question. But, but before we do, I think the key point to the, the key point to make is is that um, you know uh, just before this public hearing, there was a story on the ABC, and, and let's actually put that up on the screen where ATO data says that one third of large companies, particularly multinationals, pay no tax. And, you know, early in the year when we interviewed Senator Malcolm Roberts about the cash ban, he talked about how the big end of town uh, doesn't pay any tax. Um, a lot of it is through transfer pricing and a whole host of loopholes in the tax system. And so if it is an issue of the integrity of the tax system, if it is an issue of tax revenue, um, you know, some of the biggest companies with the biggest pockets in Australia pay no tax in Australia. And yet this bill is largely going to clamp down on small business, but also on the, uh, on, on the freedom of, of individuals. So, 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 that, so that's the backdrop. And, and Senator um, Rex Patrick, um, he, he did make that point during the hearings. But um, the, the first thing to, to note is, is that what, what the Treasury revealed um, in their testimony was that the, the $10,000 threshold that, that is the centerpiece of this legislation, the number 10,000, it was made up by the um, Black Economy Task Force. It was made up by the, uh, ch the chair, the former global head of KPMG, and there is no statistical or empirical basis um, for why that number ha um, has been selected. So we've got a couple of clips that I wanna play for the audience just to prove that, that you know, the, the Treasury officials basically confess that. So let's actually play that. Okay, and the 10,000, I think you probably covered this, but it, it's, it's, why was that number picked rather than 20 or five? Um, one, it was to complement the AML, so the money laundering and counter-terrorism financing legislation. Um, Michael thought there was a gap. Uh, the AML CTF is not economy-wide. Uh, it is mainly related to financial institutions, gambling, um, for bullion dealers and remittance dealers. So it's not a comprehensive regime. So there are things which you can do outside of that regime to, to launder money. Uh, there has been calls to expand that regime, um, to include uh, real estate agents, uh, lawyers, accountants. Um, but at the moment, the legislation only applies to, the, applies to those which currently are affected by the law. Uh, so. From that point of view, it sort of made, a, made sense to Michael and the, and the task force to set it at $10,000, because that's where you would start to suspect more suspicious transactions are starting to occur in the economy. The, the black economy, as I said at the start, is a whole of government issue. It's not just a tax issue. So it can show itself up in a numerous ways. OK, but I, you know, I have to consider this legislation on, on, on its merits, uh, and, and that involves trying to understand uh, the benefit that, that flows from this, because I've certainly got people talking to me about the cost, um, not necessarily a financial cost, but you know, um, uh, constituents making complaints uh, about the, the, the intention. Um, and this, in some sense, goes to where Senator um, Brockman was um, exploring. Uh, the $10,000 number, um, uh, you know, it, uh, 
I would expect there would be perhaps some uh, analysis or you know, perhaps qualified by um, uncertainties uh, you know, uh, as to if you put it at, if you put the, the number at ten thousand, this is the sort of revenue we expect to uh, to generate, or this is the amount of uh, money laundering we uh, expect to inhibit in some way. Versus if you drop it down to two thousand, um, yeah, this is what we then expect. I mean, it might be the case that most people who are conducting illegal activities uh, handing over wads of cash in the two to five thousand uh, dollar range, and you know, in in that instance, this bill would do very little. That uh, that's the bit I'm trying to unpack, and no one uh, to date has provided an answer as to. Um, you know where that benefit lies in return, in, in respect of consolidated revenue, and, and, and in relation to the the, the point you've picked at ten thousand dollars. Well, it's very hard to actually get data on this, um, mainly because, as I said before, it's hidden. Um, so the task so, so force, task would, for would it be fair to say that if, if this were enacted, you would then also be in a position where you wouldn't be able to even measure. The, the the effect of it. Um, I think that would be it would be difficult to do because we don't have a base we don't have a benchmark. It's pretty astonishing if you think about it that you know that 10k limit around everything else revolves is based on nothing. Precisely, and, and and you know, and what we just heard was Senator Rex Patrick basically saying he was hoping that there would be some statistical analysis, some empirical basis for why the ten thousand um, ha has been selected, um, and 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 what we have found is that the ten thousand dollars it was just made up. Um, so, so it's just an arbitrary figure plucked out of the air. Now, why I think that is significant is, is that um, the government hasn't proven the fact that they've picked the t this ten thousand uh, dollar threshold. This doesn't prove, with no given that there's no evidence behind it, this doesn't prove that the bill is actually going to achieve the the in, the intent of the bill. So, you know, it's about tax leakage. The government can't say how much uh, uh, tax revenue they're, they're going to raise from this. Um, they, you know, they can't say how many cash transactions actually occur above ten thousand, um, um, and and then they don't know the effects. So we're basically passing law. So again, this is this is why I think Kevin Rudd in two thousand and seven was critical when he said his government would have evidence based policy. Well, we are about to implement this threshold law with no evidence, um, and 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 it's just an arbitrary guess, um, and that's not good public policy. Yes, and it's also worth saying, of course, that the original Black Economy Task Force paper quoted a high-level number in terms of the saving, but it was not attributed to any particular one policy, and it's not directly associated specifically with the cash ban. Yes, yes. Now, uh, what, one of the issues that we've talked about consistently is, is 10,000 the... Um, you know, are they going to keep it at ten thousand if they pass it, or, or or are they going to change it? Now, it's interesting that the Treasury says that the former global head of KPMG, who's now deceased, picked ten thousand, and yet at the same time that he was running his task force, KPMG submitted um, um, to the task force and said no lower to five thousand or two thousand, and, and this was reported in the AFI. But but I think the key point is is that. Um, if they pass this, and if they can say, well, we thought ten thousand was going to work. We have no. We, we didn't have any basis for ten thousand, but we thought ten thousand could work. If in six or twelve months' time they say, "Well, um, you know, we actually have to change it because ten thousand actually didn't work," um, you know, they will have another argument to make because they say, "Well, uh, we we did, you know, we think the uh, law is um, you know focused in the right direction. We just need to tweak it a bit. Mm. We just need to go from about ten thousand, maybe down to five thousand, maybe down to two thousand, or or you know, I mean, the Italians have gone down to one thousand euros. Um, you know, the Greeks are down to five hundred euros. So yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, so." The fact that there's no evidence, it gives them wiggle room to come back and basically take a second bite of the cherry. Um, and, and, and obviously the, everyone's saying that, no, it's going to be 10,000. Now, uh, there has been a bit of confusion in the audience. Now, so it's clear to say that if they are to change the $10,000 threshold, a new act of parliament has to, has to pass subsequent to this bill. So it can't be done by regulation, but, but still, um, you know, the government will make the case to say that, um, you know, 
you know, if circumstances change with the economy, if, if negative interest rates were to come in, um, 10,000, um, you know, uh, doesn't do the job, we, we, we need to change it up a bit in order to improve the out- public policy outcomes. Um, so, so, so that's the big concern I have um, with the fact that they've picked an arbitrary number with no evidence. Some of the people who gave evidence, one, actually was arguing definitely to drop it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And and, and so so yeah. So, so so I'm glad you sort of mentioned that. So the Uniting Church of Australia, um, um, you know, their their witness basically said that the European evidence is that ten thousand is too high, and, and and the quote was that the optimal level. So this is going back from a, a 2017 Centre for European Studies report um, s- s- says says that um, that the the threshold should be. Um, about three or four thousand euros, and so let's actually play the United Church actually say this in front of the Senate. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair. So, Dr. Zernak or Zernak, um, so wh- why will ten thousand dollars work when the current regime doesn't work? Why will ten thousand dollars, that arbitrary figure, all of a sudden help? Well, I, basically, I mean, I think I, I actually would make the case, and, and certainly the analysis from Europe was a lower cash transaction limit would probably be more effective. So they, they came back with a, you know, the suggestion that was done by the Centre for European Policy Studies with um, ECORIS, um, E-C-O-R-Y-S, uh, basically they recommended a 3,000, 3,000, 4,000 euro cash transaction limit, and they said that would probably maximise impact on money laundering and tax evasion, uh, tax avoidance versus the cost and, and um, inconvenience to a degree on legitimate people. Well, I still don't know why the Uniting Church is so strong on this, but nevertheless, the evidence is clear. Yes, yes. So, so the interesting thing is, is that now, when I made my submission um, to Parliament about this bill, um, I actually quoted the same study um, because the study actually did say that um, if, if this really is about tax evasion, it is, you know, I mean, it, it's even got to be lower than three, four thousand euros. Um, it's got to actually be about a, a thousand euros. And so the international evidence suggests from Europe is that if this is about tax, 10,000 is too high, um, and it clearly is not going to work. So I actually have a quote from, from, from this particular study that, that uh, the United Church uh, uh, quoted, and, and I'm, I'm just going to read it because I think this is an important quote. So this is from page 11 of the study. Uh, quote, a high ban would not fulfill the purpose of reducing tax evasion. Even a threshold of 1,000 euros is most likely going to be too high because the vast majority of tax evasion cases concerns small amounts and would not be affected. The lower the threshold value, the more cash settled commercial payments are likely to be affected by a cash payment limit. To sum up, to be effective, despite the limitations of the measure, the threshold should be as low as possible. So this is what the Europeans say. So if the key case for the government is this is about tax evasion, Europe has already said that based on their experience, 10,000 is not gonna work. And if it's not gonna work, why are we doing this, Martin? Yeah. And it's also worth, again, underscoring that if, in fact, it has to come way down, then way more transactions would be caught. Yes. Right? So it becomes a bigger nightmare in terms of trying to police it, control it, and essentially tightens the whole financial system and forces more transactions and more people to use the banks. Yes, yes. Now, the interesting thing that I sort of quoted in my submission is even if you lower the threshold, um, one country at least has said um, this law basically has no beneficial impact on tax evasion, and that's actually Austria. Mm. So I want to just quote this. This is from page 150 of the same Centre for European Studies report, uh, where, where it says, quote, the Austrian National Bank generally considers restrictions of cash payments as ineffective in the fight against tax evasion. They stress that Austria has a rather low shadow economy compared to other European countries, despite its high level of cash usage. So, um, you know, even the Europe, the, the Austrians are saying, so Europe as a whole saying, 10,000 is too high, it's got to be much lower if, if this is really about tax evasion. But even if you lower it, the Austrians say, um, this is not going to work. And, and, and Austria uses, the Austrian people use, use a lot of um, cash in, in their day-to-day transactions. So. On, on, on the primary objective of the bill, um, the bill fails to achieve 
what the government claims. Um, um, and, and again, you know, if this is evidence-based policy, the government has to prove to us this is going to work. Um, and basically, what I can see is is that the whole case for the government has fallen apart. Mm. And they did say it was unquantifiable, so the benefits will be unquantifiable, which basically gives them an out, because ultimately they won't be able to prove the benefit subsequent. Yes, yes. Now, w w one of the sort of key points that sort of came out through the hearings is is that, um, you know, uh, it, how, how does tax evasion occur? People, tra you know, uh, tradies, for example, or, 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 or other sort of businesses providing goods or services, they try to um, do deals in cash off the books. Um, uh, and they're trying to avoid tax. Now, it was actually, um, uh, I think, Senator Rex, Re Re Senator Rex Patrick, he made the point that isn't, you know, if you are engaged in commercial transactions um, and you do not report that as part of your t tax affairs, isn't there a law making that illegal in the first place? Mm. Um, and the answer is yes. Mm. So, so, what, so there was a very good exchange with the Small Business Ombudsman. So let's actually play that because uh, I think what Senator Rex Patrick proves is there's already laws dealing with this issue uh, on tax evasion and therefore there's no need for a new law. So let's actually play that. I just want to understand right now if I make a cash transaction uh, to a, a, as a small businessman making a cash transaction to a another small businessman um, or business, and um, and I don't report that in my books. Is that an offence? Uh, it would depend on the transaction, but if, if it's for a business purpose, so you're paying somebody income, it needs to be recorded. So if it's okay, income, so, so. so already there is an offence in, in effect if you, oh, yes. if you are um, operating uh, in the context of a black market by not recording uh, a business transaction on your books. Yeah, that's correct, Senator. That's the substance, and that's where our view as the law should focus on the substance of a bad transaction, yeah. uh, not the form of that bad transaction. So, so, in effect, there's already a law in place that deals with the sort of conduct. In fact, it deals with the, that sort of conduct all the way down to a, a couple of dollars. And remember that Andrew Wilkie in the lower house made the point, similar point, there are already laws in place, those laws are not being policed. Precisely, precisely. So, 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 yeah. So, you know, um, if the ATO, if other agencies are, um, you know, um, are not effective in implementing existing law, the government should be focused on better enforcement of existing laws rather than introducing new laws that that basically have no evidence that they work um, and that there's no need for them. Mm. So, so yeah, so, so Martin, um, that 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 I think tears apart this whole case, this whole basic premise around tax evasion. Now, the second um, um, reason for why the government says we need this law, it is about money laundering. Um, uh, now, um, obviously, the backdrop on the money laundering question is that we've seen with Westpac, uh, 23 million uh, transactions uh, basically f fell through the existing regime. Um, um, and that and, and that is obviously a big issue in and of itself. Um, so, 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 so yeah. So um, you know, again, if people, if the government wants to focus on um, money laundering, um, even with its existing laws, ex its existing regulatory enforcement mechanism, um, you know, there are big things falling through the cracks on that. So they need to get their own house in order. But but it's interesting that Austrac, when they testified during the hearing, they said that was there was a very specific type of money laundering that this bill was going to address that the existing framework um, wasn't going to cover. So let's actually play Austrac's testimony on this question. What is the money laundering risk that's mm -hmm. caught by the current legislation that is not currently caught by your existing reporting obligations? Austrac considers that the cash payment limit is a very uh, use useful measure that will help um, address a money laundering risk to the economy that is not currently covered by the AML CTF Act. It's about targeting the money laundering risk associated with cash. Cash is globally recognised as imposing an inherently high risk for money laundering. Cash transactions, as I'm sure you would appreciate, are anonymous. The money can be readily exchanged and is often untraceable. That's o the whole point of money, isn't it? I was it's in the context of Austrac's done some analysis around this, and it's in the context generally of how it's used in connection with high value goods, which are attractive to 
criminals wishing to launder money that we see that there are benefits in the cash payment limit in helping address a money laundering risk to the Australian economy. Um, okay. So what are the attributes of the transactions that are hoped to be caught by this that make them a money laundering risk uh, in the economy that aren't caught by any other mechanism? So we don't currently regulate the transactions by high value dealers. We don't, if someone is purchasing or selling a high value good such as jewellery, art, um, antiquities, luxury cars, that would not be something that they would be required by using cash, not be required to report to Austrac. Okay. So do we have any idea of the scale of that issue? Or is that more a question that for Treasury? That would be more a ATO? question for Treasury. Okay. Well, I didn't find that very convincing, did you? No, no. So, so, so it's interesting that the Austrac would say that they're going to cover uh, this law would cover high value dealers. Mm. Um, so, so things to do with with antiques, collectibles, all of that sort of stuff. Now, um, the, the key, one of the key points that was made, uh, I made in my submission, you made in your submission, and I think it was said during the testimony is is um, the, the, you know. One of the big risks on money laundering in Australia is doing money laundering through real estate transactions. Mm. Now, the OECD um, and a whole bunch of other organisations have said that the existing anti-money laundering framework should be expanded to include uh, real estate agents, uh, and currently they are exempt. Now, th there is some question about whether you expand it to lawyers and accountants as well. But but, uh, but but yeah, the um, uh, and, and I know that certain uh, uh, people in Parliament have been pushing for, to, uh, for the framework to cover real estate agents for, for quite a few years, and yet both major parties won't touch real estate. So so m my issue is is that if money laundering is such a big deal, uh, fix up the banks uh, because Westpac and CBA prove that that there are big problems there. But but where is the greatest amount of risk around money laundering outside of the current regime? It's around real estate, and that's what's been called by the OECD. And the OECD, or I haven't seen any organisation, um, you know, independent of government, have said that high-value dealers like antique dealers um, uh, or you know things of that na of that nature, collectibles. That's where a lot of money uh, money laundering is happening, or in terms of jewellery. Again, I think the the whole case on money laundering has has fallen apart um, in terms of what the government. You know, claims it's going to be because you know one of the questions that was asked is well, what's the extent of money laundering in this area? How much will this sort of clean up? And they can't answer those questions. <laughs> no, they just don't know. And I noticed that in Canada, there's a lot of initiatives now rolling out there, specifically looking at money laundering in the real estate sector. So they've identified that as a critical area which they need to address. So it's interesting that they've gone in that direction. Yes, they've gone in that direction, and we have legislation before Parliament that is amending the existing any money laundering uh, counter terrorism uh, framework, mm. um, and yet there is nothing uh, uh, there. There is nothing in this proposed law by the government that's going to touch the real estate the real estate sector. Yep. So again, you know, um, I, mean, I mean, I mean, I think that this is proof that the government is not serious about money laundering because where where if we you know they should be focused on where they should be getting the biggest bang for the buck. Mm. Um, and, and they just are not focused on that. Yep. So we've knocked them over in terms of money laundering. We've knocked them over in terms of um, tax evasion. Yes. So what does that leave us with then, John? The next place to go to is unconventional monetary policy because uh, a lot of submissions talk about this because we've talked about this, and yet the establishment says this is conspiracy. Um, uh, and and has, it's, it's consistently been, this is far-fetched, you're, you're, clucking, you're, you know, you're, you're uh, uh, clutching at straws, even though the Black Economy Task Force has said this will help monetary policy, even though the IMF said let's eliminate cash, even though the IMF said let's take interest rates to negative 4%. And if I do get to testify to the Senate, I mean, I'll be making a series of points on this particular point to say, Stop saying it's a conspiracy because I, I, I will print out these documents <laughs> and I will have these documents on the table and saying yep. these are the precise documents from the IMF saying that um, in order to launch 
unconventional po- uh, unconventional monetary policy, you need to get cash out of the system. So now we have the RBA. Um, they they were they were um, asked about this specific point by the chair of the committee, um, and, and you know they were sort of saying this is slightly far fetched. So let's actually play the RBA responding to this issue of unconventional monetary policy and negative interest rates. I think that that discussion is not really relevant for the current bill. The issue for the current bill is should there be a limit on uh, very high, should there be a limit, a ban on the use of, um, uh, in in business, of um, very large um, transactions using cash. Um, But the concerns that you referred to, I think, are very different. And it's a scenario that I think is something like this, that um, somehow this is a a precursor to the imposition of negative interest rates and the government deciding to withdraw cash from circulation. Um, I'd make three points uh, on that scenario. Uh, The first one is that monetary policy is set by the Reserve Bank Board. Um, It's not set by Treasury, the ATO, the Black Economy Task Force, um, or with greatest respect by by Parliament. Um, It's set uh, set by the board according to the mandate that has been given to the board under the Reserve Bank Act. And um, uh, the second one is that the governor has spoken recently on on this issue uh, and talking about the possibility of the policy rate, so that is the the cash rate target going, um, he said um, that he views the negative interest rates in Australia, the prospect of negative interest rates in Australia as extremely unlikely. And he also made the point that even in countries where the policy interest rate has gone slightly negative, the um, interest rates received by households on their deposits haven't. That there's almost no examples of um, negative interest rates uh, rece- for, for household deposits in, in, in those few co- countries that have, got, have had negative policy rates. Well, I guess they took a relatively benign start on negative interest rates, but it's not really realistic, is it? No, no. Everyone is, cl- you know, everyone at the RBA is saying the governor said this is extremely unlikely, mm. but, but he didn't say it was never going to happen. He never yep. said never, ever. Even though in '95 John Howard said never ever on GST, and it still happened. <laughs> um, but, but, but as we covered in a previous show, the the RBA governor said that that if pressed, all options on the table, including ne- negative interest rate. So um, it gives me no comfort that the RBA governor said extremely unlikely. Um, and, 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 and so obviously, you know, that is a big risk coming forward um, uh, in 2020, 2021 around around negative interest rates, particularly particularly because we have no runway. Um, at three quarters percent, we're going half percent in February, um, and obviously, if we go into a, a, a mild or deep recession, um, you know, where are they going to go in terms of interest rate? I mean, they can only go negative. Um, so, 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 yeah. So, so, so that's one concern I have. The other thing I thought was extraordinary was that um, you know the, the the officials said that that almost no how, um, households have lost money because of negative interest rates now. Uh, it's interesting he used the word almost because some have. Mm. And, 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 but, but the key th- point on this is, is that the, the story about commercial banks responding to negative interest rates, um, you know, the story is evolving. So you know, we've seen the Danish banks have started with a, a, a balances of over a million. Now they've gone to 100,000. Now some of the German banks are saying we're going to uh, apply to everyone. Um, and, 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 you know, these are still negative interest rates less than 1%, less than negative 1%. If we go into beyond negative one percent, negative two, negative three, negative four, um, no, um, household household deposits right across the world are going to be impacted by by these certain policies. Um, so, 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 so yeah, so when they say nothing to worry about because household deposits are rarely touched, um, you know, um, you know, it's too premature for the RBA to say this because the, you know we're going to see more households across the world being impacted by this um, mm. in the next two years. So the question is, have they not read the IMF papers? Or have they read the IMF papers and chosen to ignore them? Well, well, I mean, that, that's, that's what I'm not sure. But I would definitely, if I am to testify, I would definitely have the IMF papers with me. Um, and I'll be saying to the senators, these are the papers. You can't ignore them. This is what they say. Yeah. And just to underscore, the IMF papers say 
to respond appropriately to, in the negative interest rate environment, given where cash rates currently are, you need to be able to take rates down to minus two, minus three, minus four. Yes. That's where that number comes from. Precisely, because yep. they say in a recession, you have to lower interest rates between three to 6%. Yep. Um, so if we're, if we're less than 1% now, well, where, are we, where, where can this go? It's negative two, three, four, five. Yep. Um, so, 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 so that's where it comes through. So I, I think, you know, the, the, the um, you know, the RBA was trying to diffuse this issue, um, and I don't think they actually diffused it. I think they were basically um, putting up a mirage, a smoke screen, trying to um, 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 you know distract the senators from focusing on this issue. But 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 again, I think that uh, people who who are communicating with politicians, they need to um, you know. Quote, you know, and go through our previous shows, go through these papers, find these things and say to senators, this is where all, all, all of this information is. It's not, you know, this is not make-believe. It is actually real and it's actually in the, in, in the public domain. Yep. Good point. So, 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 so we're going to cover like uh, two final facts, uh, Martin. So one that really came out um, with the Small Business Ombudsman is this issue of debanking. Mm. So, 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 so what it is is that... Um, sir, the banks are refusing service to certain businesses that are legal uh, but are controversial. So it could be tattoo parlors, it could be um, um, certain pawn shops. I've heard examples of certain bullion dealers. Um, uh, I think in, in the testimony, they, they even said some news agents uh, were, were, for whatever reason, the banks said, we, we just don't want your business. Mm. Um, and the whole issue of debanking is that if you can't use a um, if you can't use a bank, a bank service, if you can't use a bank account, and it's illegal to use cash, well, how do you do business? Um, and I thought that was a very um, um, interesting point and very valid point that was made. So let's actually play this interaction with a small business ombudsman where he talks about debanking. We're coming across a number of situations where banks are actually removing people from their books. So we, we call it debanking. Um, so, for example, call, sorry, uh, what? debanking, debanking. So not okay. offering services. Sure. So, so this could be you know, your point of sale equipment, mm -hmm. but this can also be you know, even holding a, an account with the bank. Uh, and it's happening across a number of industries where we've seen some of it's um, news agents, um, some of it's adult services uh, and, and other industries as well. So um, we've seen uh, examples of people associated with tattoo parlours or gun shops also being de debanked as well. So for social... Uh, conscience reasons, are you um, saying? Or? We are having trouble fathoming exactly for what reason, Senator. So okay. Why you would try to actually debank legitimate businesses. So, so uh, in, that, in that respect, it would be quite legitimate for businesses to try and debank banks <laughs> because they certainly have a, an awful track record. And the government is, in effect, forcing people to use these very entities that engage in abhorrent commercial conduct. I think the key here, Senator, is that if a bank refuses to deal with a particular business um, and the business needs to make transactions of over $10,000, requiring a business to deal with an entity that won't deal with them puts that business in an impossible position. And that's a really critical point, John, isn't it? Because if you are forced to use the banking system and yet you're being debanked at the same time, you can't run a business. Precisely. So, so yes. So here's, here's this. You know, uh, you know, the Liberal Party, the party of the individual, the party of small business, um, and yet they're basically, you know, uh, you know, for certain types of businesses which are legal, they're basically going to shut these businesses down um, purely because uh, how, how do they how do how do they do business? Um, so, and, and you know, what I suspect is is that this is probably again an unintended consequence that the government and the Black Economy Task Force, when they put the report together, they didn't consider to say, well, if the banks are doing X, how will this law actually impact um, certain uh, businesses across the economy? Mm. Um, and because they haven't considered this, I mean, so this is one unintended consequence. What are the other ones that, that the government hasn't picked up in designing this law and this policy? Well, I'll tell you one, you'll see a rise in bartering. So in other words, providing direct services and in return getting carrots or something that's what will happen ah uh, well yeah, but, but, but okay so that could happen but but how does that actually impact on tax well it's another way of that would be completely going around the economy right so it's actually more risky than using cash
Y yes, yes, because because technically, uh, if you and I were to do bartering uh, and you know we qualify for GST, we're going to apply GST. Well, I mean. How would you know if you're going to give me carrots? What are you going to give me? And ten percent extra carrot? And, and 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 what do I do to do? I actually give like a carrot stick to the ATO and said that's my GST contribution. That's, um, that's the whole point. Yeah. But but seriously, in countries where they've got issues in the banking system, right? People default back to trading directly. Yes. So that's an unintended consequence that no one's thought about. Yeah, well, and, and remember, the intent of the bill is to stop tax evasion. No. And what you're saying is, if we go to bartering, it is actually going to increase tax evasion. Correct. Exactly. So, um, um, so, 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 so that is very interesting. Now, the, the last thing um, that, that I think is, is worthwhile now, um, you know, I, I mean, I'm an economist, you're a banking expert. Neither, neither one of us are qualified lawyers, but we did hear from the Law Council of Australia mm. And they talked about how difficult this is going to be to actually enforce in court of law, um, to actually you know secure a prosecution um, um, because of the evidence burden that that a, that the uh, DPP would require to actually prove that um, an individual or a business actually engaged in a cash transaction. So 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 let's actually play the, the law council actually uh, basically making this point to the senators. Okay. So yeah, finally for me. So so your contention is that. At the very least, there should be amendments made. There are unintended consequences, and there is a body of work going on which addresses this problem anyway. Uh, yes, and I'm, I'm aware that there are uh, there are um, there is some I think some draft rules circulating, but, um, but I suppose the other two points I'd like to make is that um, it, it would be a very difficult law to enforce because. Um, you can imagine, you know, you're in court, um, you'd almost need an eyewitness to say, um, you know, I saw, you know, um, this this guy in the shop, you know, took the, t took ten took ten thousand dollars from, uh, you know, this customer, and um, you know, that's that's wrong. So, you know, unless you're really unlucky, and you're in line behind a, a federal policeman or something. Um, it's 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 entirely plausible, I think, to um, have concern that, you know, there's a law here that may be um, not enforced in, in the ordinary course. May, I understand there's no real plans to um, publicise it, so it may well be widely dis, um, you know, not, um, um, not observed, just through ignorance, and, and then there's risks of if you like, arbitrary enforcement, and um, you know, which brings up basic principles of justice. And you know, why is one person, um, you know, imagine that it's like a speeding fine. You know, why is one person picked out of a line of speeding cars and prosecuted when another okay. one isn't? Um, so, and that again, from a, from the perspective of sort of fundamental legal principle, would be of of concern. And that's really quite a scary point, isn't it? Yes. That. Even if you bring this bill in, it's going to be very hard to enforce. It's going to be very hard to justify in the legal sense. Y yes, and, and one of the key points that the, uh, the the witness from the law council made is is that you know we could have a situation of where we're going to have arbitrary justice and, and arbitrary enforcement mm. because you know um, you know because it's so hard to get evidence about an individual um, because because it's not just about making an offer the transaction actually has to go forward and and so you know so so in some cases where um, the, you know the the uh, you know. Whoever someone may dob in one individual, but then someone may be able to get away with it um, in another situation, and and then that's completely unfair because you, you you know you don't have a uniform um, application of the law um, because it's just so hard to actually prove. So again, um, you know when when this law was designed, when the bill was designed, I don't think they went to prosecutors, they went to lawyers and actually said um, how you know how do we actually enforce this. Uh, because the other point that was made during the testimony was um, that no one agency is responsible for implementing this law, mm. but because there are criminal sanctions, I mean, if there is a criminal act, it'll have to be the uh, Australian Federal Police and the DPP. Um, and it is interesting that when this issue came up in the coalition party room, one of the people who opposed this 
was a criminal lawyer who's a politi- who's a politician, um, and he just basically said that um, that this is completely focused in the wrong direction. Uh, and, and obviously, criminal lawyer, he's seen a lot of criminal cases in his experience. Yeah, a whole another can of worms there. Yeah. So 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 what we've covered is seven key points that I think are very critical uh, about why the government's case has completely fallen apart. So John, we have seven weeks. And we've got seven facts. I think these facts are critical. Um, and for those who are still engaging, talking to local politicians, I know there are certain delegations happening across the country. Mm. Um, I, mean, I would advise people beyond all the things that we've already discuss- discussed in all the other videos, um, these seven facts, I think, pull apart the government's case on the evidence that we've seen to date. Um, if I get to testify, I'll be making some of these points in front of the senators to really hit the, ho- really hit the point hard. Um, uh, but, 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 but particularly, uh, you know, one of the key risks is, is that, um, you know, the government says this is going to be 10,000. They made up the number. Uh, they could easily come back and say we need to lower the number to actually make this, um, to make this t- the issue of tax to be more, more, more effective. Um, and w- one of the points that was made by the Australian Taxpayers Alliance that we haven't covered today is, is that the, the threshold um, um, it's not it's not um, indexed to inflation. So uh, basically, what they said was, um, in ten years' time, the the threshold is technically eight thousand dollars, not ten thousand dollars, because of the effects of inflation. So so you know, as we go forward, um, you know, some people think that they're not going to be um, impacted by this law because they don't have ten thousand dollars. Well, you know, through the impacts of inflation, through the impacts of um, negative interest rates, um, you know, uh, you know, if the government tries to lower the amount at some point down down the track, because of people pulling money out of the banks or bartering or whatever the case may be, um, you know, um, you know, people will be impacted in one form or another, and and so this is why I think it's so critical. Given that the government hasn't made the case, there is no evidence to support the government's position that we um, knock this on the head and stop the government before uh, you know before we, we get a Frankenstein economy in 2020. Yeah, and to be clear, it doesn't pass muster on freedom. Yeah. It doesn't pass muster on money laundering, on tax evasion, and it leaves the door open for monetary policy to be able to effectively force people into the banking system. Yes, and, 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 and the key point is, but also the key point is, it doesn't pass muster in terms of, um, you know, how you're going to actually enforce this law in practice. Yeah. So, seven weeks, it's over to our audience. They've got an opportunity to pick up the phone, write a letter, send an email, reinforce to their MPs, and particularly Labour MPs, that this is just not a good way to go. Absolutely. John, appreciate your time today. Thank you. Martin North, John Adams, in the interest of people. We'll see you next time.